Japanese Literature. My name is Allison Fincher. Read Japanese Literature is a podcast about Japanese fiction and some of its best works. All the works we discuss are available in translation, so you can read along if you want. You can find out more at readjapaneseliterature.com. In this episode, is she a man-eating crone? Is she a lonely wanderer? Or is she a sensual matriarch? However you define her, she's the Yamauba, Japan's legendary mountain witch. Once upon a time, there was a stingy man. He lived all alone because he never wanted to pay for anything. But he wished he had a wife, a wife who would never eat. Soon enough, a beautiful woman who didn't eat appeared on his doorstep. But even though his wife never ate a thing in front of him, all of his hoarded rice seemed to disappear day by day. One day, the man decided to spy on his beautiful wife. And while he watched, hidden behind a screen, horror-stricken, the hair on the back of her head parted to reveal a second gaping mouth. Her hair reached out like tentacles to stuff that mouth full of his rice. This stingy man had the misfortune to marry a futakuchi ona, or a two-mouthed woman. She is an example of one of Japan's most famous folklore characters, a yamauba, or a mountain witch. Today we're going to talk about how the legend of the yamauba has evolved over time and its continuing place in Japanese culture. Then we'll look at the life and work of Minako Oba, one of the great women writers of post-war Japan, and we'll focus especially on her story, The Smile of the Mountain Witch. The easiest definition of a Yama Oba is that she is a character from Japanese folklore, but as you might guess, it gets a lot more complicated. First, I should note that the pronunciations Yamauba and Yamamba and Yamanba are all perfectly acceptable as well. I'm using Yamauba because I think it's the easiest to pronounce. I'd also like to note that today I'm relying once again on the work of Dr. Rebecca Copeland at Washington University in St. Louis. She worked with Dr. Linda Ehrlich at Case Western Reserve University. And together the two co-edited Yamamba, In Search of the Japanese Mountain Witch. It's a fascinating book. The introduction calls it the first work in English to be written for the Yamamba. It's also the first book that introduced me to the study of the Yamauba and to Minako Oba. So let's ask again, what is a Yamauba? The term Yamauba dates back to the Muromachi period of Japanese history. That's 1336 to 1573. But the stories about mountain witches in Japan are even older. In the oldest Yamauba tales, the mountain witch is something like a demon or maybe an ogre. Sometimes she helps people. Maybe more often she harms people or at least causes them mischief. In one of the better known myths about a mountain hag, she takes in an unmarried pregnant woman After the woman gives birth, she realizes that the hag actually plans to eat her newborn baby. Don't worry, both mother and child escape while the hag is napping. But cannibalism is one of the most common features of early Yamauba legends. The Yamauba's appearance matches her character. She's old, really old, wrinkled, wild white hair, gaping mouth, huge round eyes, monstrous. And even if all of this sounds new, you're probably more familiar with the Yamauba than you think. The witch from European fairy tales like Hansel and Gretel nicely fits into the Yamauba mold. So does the Baba Yaga from Russian fairy tales. The Pokemon Jinx is based on the Yamauba. Actually, the Pokemon Mawile is based on precisely the witch we opened with, the Futakuchi Ona with the mouth in the back of her head. And one of Japan's most prominent 20th century Yamauba appears in one of the most acclaimed films of the 21st century to date, Spirited Away from Studio Ghibli. 
Over time, the character of the Yamauba changed. One of the most famous depictions of the Yamauba is from a 15th century No play called Yamamba. We talked about No a little bit in an earlier episode. No is a highly stylized fusion of dance, musical performance, and religious ritual. The protagonist, the shte or doing hand, moves across an almost bare stage to musical accompaniment. Like most of the characters in No drama, the shte wears one of No's iconic masks. No doesn't tend to have antagonists in the European theatrical sense. The character opposite the protagonist is called the Waki, and the Waki listens to the protagonist's story. The Waki is always a living person, as opposed to a a demon or a ghost, and the Waki doesn't wear a mask. The no play Yamamba is one of the greatest and most widely performed works of no drama. In some ways, it's almost a play within a play. It opens with a skillful dancer, or with a dancer playing a skillful dancer who plays the Yamamba. One day, this dancer decides to make a pilgrimage. On the way, she and her entourage are shocked when the sun suddenly sets. An old woman invites them to stay with her for the night. As you might guess, that woman is the play's real protagonist, or shte, and she reveals herself to be the Yamamba. She asks the dancer to perform the Yamamba dance. In the end, the Yamamba describes to the dancer what life as a Yamamba is really like. Sometimes as mountain dwellers traversing the woodman's trail take rest in the shade of blossoms, I help shoulder their burden, accompanying them as they make their way down the mountain just as the moon rises, sometimes as far as their village. Again at other times, like the warbler on the willow branch, I reel thread, entering in at the window where scores of looms of weaver maids stand, placing myself in the spinning hut simply for the purpose of helping people. Now this is a slightly different Yamamba than the Yamamba we saw in folklore. Sometimes she helps, and she's a lot less sinister. Like most no drama, the whole play here is deeply Buddhist. The Yamamba describes herself as someone who, dragging good and evil with her, makes her mountain rounds. The Yamamba isn't just bad, because Buddhism is a non-dualist religion. There is no easy, comfortable division between good and bad. You can't have a Yamamba who's just a villain, because there are no easy villains. She, like all people, is good and evil at the same time. The Yamauba became even more popular in the Edo period, that 1603 to 1867. The Yamauba became an important symbol of old Japan. For example, if an author wanted to invoke pre-14th century Japan in an historical play, there was a good chance the author ought to include a Yamauba. We haven't talked about jewelry before. But I need to at least briefly mention it here. Jewelry is a form of Japanese performance art that involves the use of puppets. It was massively popular and very culturally important. It's important for our purposes today because one of the great writers of jewelry theater, Chikamatsu Monzaemon, helped change the Yamauba's image again. Chikamatsu's play The Yamamba with Child popularized a new Yamauba, as mother of the semi-legendary hero Sakata Kintoki. Sakata Kintoki, alternately known as Kintaro or Golden Boy, may or may not have been a real historical figure. He's supposed to have been a retainer of Minamoto Yorimitsu, who was a real historical figure, who lived from 948 to 1021. As Kintaro's mother, the Yamauba becomes beautiful and seductive. Here I'm borrowing descriptions from the work of Dr. Mira Viswanathan at Stanford. The Yamauba's hair is still uncombed, but now it's the kind of disheveled associated with a woman who has just climbed out of her partner's bed. 
And her clothes are still torn, but artfully torn to be revealing in just the right way. But no matter how much the Yama Uba changed over time, she was always other. The other is everything that's not like me, everything that's not culturally normal. The other is a philosophical term, especially in the last hundred years or so, philosophers and ethicists have pointed out just how often people who are other are people who are pushed to the margins, racial minorities, colonized peoples, people who are LGBTQ, people with disabilities, people who live in poverty. And feminists have observed that women have been othered in many societies throughout human history. How many philosophers and scientists have defined women as men, but without penises? So the Yama Uba is definitely other. She's a woman. She's almost always associated with the mountains. Even today, the mountains are a kind of in-between place. And the Yama Uba doesn't live like anyone else. Norika Mizuta has been an important professor of comparative literature on both sides of the Pacific. She describes the Yama Uba as the opposite of the women of the village, the opposite of normal women. The village is a safe place. It is a place where people are protected and insulated from danger. Women of the village have clear expectations for their behavior chastity, obedience, compassion, the Yama Uba lives completely outside of these norms. To me, the story of the Yama Uba gets really interesting starting in the 1950s. That's when Japanese women writers started to reclaim negative female figures from folklore But before we get there, I want to provide just a little bit of context about 20th century Japanese feminism. Why are Japanese women writers interested in reclaiming negative female figures from folklore at all? If you listen to the first season of this podcast, you probably noticed that we've been keeping an eye on the role of Japanese women. We've talked about how women may have played an important religious or even political role in early Japan. In fact, the earliest written account of Japan is a Chinese description of the country of Wa under the control of a woman named Pimiko. Women in the Heian court lived with some severe limitations on who they could see and what they could do. So we're talking about elite women from 794 to 1185. But these women also had a certain level of sexual and marital independence And they were also highly educated and produced some of Japan's most enduring literature. Medieval Japan was dominated by the warrior class. Women's roles became even more limited, although there were some notable exceptions. And then the Edo period. In many ways, the Edo period was a low point for women's rights in Japan. Keep in mind, though, that the same can be said in much of Europe and the U.S. At this point in British history, for example, women most certainly couldn't own property. The Parliament of the United Kingdom finally passed the Married Women's Property Act in 1882. Anyway, in Japan, the rules that defined a well-to-do woman's role in life are often summarized as the three obediences. A woman should be obedient first— as a daughter to her father, then as a chaste wife to her husband, and then as a widow dedicated to her family, obedient to her son. The Meiji government implemented radical reforms after the Edo period ended, starting in 1868. That included an overhaul of the education system. Beginning in 1872, the government mandated some schooling for all boys and girls. In many ways, this is a remarkable improvement. But for a woman, this education is still aimed towards sexist ends. It would ideally make a woman into a good wife and wise mother, a ryōsai kenbo. A burgeoning feminist movement pushed for social change, and that included greater political rights for women as well as the right to vote, but they didn't achieve a lot of success. 
We haven't talked as much about women after the Meiji period. I want to do that in more detail later. For now, a broad overview. Nationalists worldwide like to use women as a propaganda tool. Japanese nationalists in the 1930s leaned hard into Ryo Saikenbo. The National Women's Defense Association even used the slogan, National Defense Comes from the Kitchen. There were certainly women who continued to fight for women's rights, but many of the most prominent women's rights advocates were also staunch supporters of the government and the war. After the war, the U.S. occupation forced the Japanese government to accept a new constitution. It granted a variety of fundamental human rights, including all the civil rights and civil liberties of the American Bill of Rights, but it went way beyond what Americans, or people almost anywhere else, are guaranteed under their constitutions. In particular, it gave women explicit guarantees of equality in marriage, divorce, property, inheritance, and, quote, other matters pertaining to marriage and the family. As an aside, if you're looking for a fascinating story, look into the work and life of Beate Sirota Gordon. She helped push these constitutional protections for women, protections that still don't exist in the American Constitution, into the Japanese Constitution. She was just 22 years old. Anyway, In 1946, 39 women were elected to the Japanese Diet. That included many women who had already spent years fighting for women's rights in Japan. More than 8% of representatives elected to the lower house that year were women, and that number wasn't matched for decades. But despite these guarantees on paper, Japanese activists continued to fight for years to see actual cultural and policy change. Japanese activists are still fighting to see cultural and policy changes. I'm going to limit myself to one of the biggest issues for post-war Japanese feminists, Japanese family law. Traditionally, Japanese law treated most people as part of their multi-generational families. This is called the Ie, or house system. The head of the household was usually, but not always, male. Under the Meiji Civil Code, that's Japanese law before the war, the head of the household had something like absolute authority over all family members. Married women became persons of legal incapacity. That means they weren't legally competent to make their own decisions about much of anything. The 1945 constitution abolished the most restrictive aspects of the EA system, as we've already discussed. But the EA system is still an important part of Japanese law. For example, families are required to keep a family register of births, deaths, and marriages. Families are required to appoint one person as the head of a household. This person isn't necessarily a man, but it is almost always a husband or father, even today. Everyone in a household must take the same family name when they marry, Again, this doesn't have to be the husband's name, but it almost always is. And there have been a number of court cases in the last decade or so brought by women who want to keep their own family names after marriage. Culturally, Japanese women found themselves typecast even more aggressively as housewives in the 1950s. The government and culture still tried to force women into the Ryosai Kenbo model. They just changed the goal. Instead of military success, good wives and wise mothers would benefit Japan's economic miracle. Women gained some of their political power because they were housewives. Who better to talk about food shortages than the women who couldn't feed their families? Who better to talk about nuclear disarmament than the mothers of children who would be harmed? So Japanese women found themselves with new political rights on paper, and in their daily lives, their government and culture expected them to take on supporting roles as wives to salary men to support economic growth. And the symbol of the housewife actually granted them some additional political power, if at a price. It's a contradiction. It's a contradiction that Japanese women are still dealing with today. It's a contradiction that Japanese law and Japanese culture are still dealing with today. 
As always, I'm an American who is aware of potential hypocrisy. My country doesn't have a great record on women's rights, especially at this moment in history. But here's a nice quote from the then Japanese health minister talking about women in summer of 2020. And I think it summarizes the attitude a lot of Japanese women are still fighting against. The number of women aged between 15 and 50 is fixed. Because the number of birth-giving machines and devices is fixed, all we can do is ask them to do their best per head, although it may not be so appropriate to call them machines. So here's where the Yama Uba comes in. If you're informed by feminist thinking and you're reclaiming negative or ambiguous female figures from folklore, the Yama Uba is an obvious choice. She's free from the EA system and exempt from the rules that govern the rest of us. Men fear her, and she isn't a wife. She's not even a prostitute or a mistress. She doesn't have to rely on men. Noriko Mizuta worded it nicely. One reason why Yamamba could become a prototype for modern women's pursuance of self is that she inherently annuls such concepts as motherhood versus independence and family versus work. You don't have to worry about social norms if you're a mountain witch. Yamauba isn't inherently a feminist symbol. She's just pretty easy to make into one. And she's easy to make into one because her very existence makes the kinds of political questions facing post-war Japanese women irrelevant. There are a lot of post-war Japanese women writers who take up Yamauba imagery. Some of these writers do so explicitly and name their demon of choice. Others do so implicitly with complex and sinister female characters. Woman Running in the Mountains by Yuko Tsushima evokes the idea of freedom in the mountains for an unwed mother in 1970s Japan. Geraldine Harcourt's translation was reissued earlier this year. Highly recommended. Fumiko Enshi has a spectacularly haunting villainess, behind the scenes in her novel Masks. The Yama Uba is less explicit, though she's definitely present. The entire novel is certainly full of no imagery. That one was translated by Juliet Winters Carpenter. It would make a fantastically creepy October read, not scary, but darkly atmospheric. Julia Bullock at Emory University made a study of Yama Uba imagery in 1960s and 70s Japanese literature, She looked especially at Castle of Bones by Takako Takahashi. Unfortunately, I don't think that one has been translated. Another fascinating example is The Goddess Chronicle by Natsuo Kirino, translated into English by Rebecca Copeland. We talked about the myth of Izanami and Izanagi in this podcast's very first episode. The story of Izanami has some notable overlaps with the story of Yama Uba, A man finds in the central figure more than he expects, and he ends up having to run away in fear. Of course, there's also the work of Minako Oba. The Yama Uba is one of the central figures in a lot of her work, as we'll see in just a minute. And if I've missed any examples of the Yama Uba in 20th century Japanese women's writing, please reach out to me through Twitter or the website. I would love to know more, and I would love to be able to share. Minako Oba was born in the fall of 1930. That means she's a part of the generation of writers, Japanese people in general, whose childhood is more or less defined by the war. You might remember that Yukio Mishima was born in 1925 and Kinzaburo Oe was born in 1935. Oba's family moved a lot when she was a little girl, but she still received an excellent education. Her parents and grandparents were well-read, and they made sure that she had lots of books and literary journals on hand. But then 14-year-old Oba was sent to Hiroshima Prefecture as part of a wartime student mobilization project. 
She and her classmates weren't in Hiroshima City when the U.S. dropped the first atomic bomb, but they were close enough. They were all sent to assist bomb victims and to help with relief efforts. It was a harrowing experience that Oba never forgot. After the war, Oba was able to return to her education. She graduated from one of Japan's most progressive women's universities in 1955. That winter, she married an engineer named Toshio Oba, but only, she made him promise, if she could continue writing. In 1959, she followed her husband and his career to Sitka, Alaska. They lived in the U.S. for 11 years. Olpa's career as a housewife was eclectic for a 1960s housewife in Japan or the U.S. She took long road trips across America. She started a graduate degree in painting at the University of Wisconsin at Madison that she later finished at the University of Washington in Seattle. While she was at UW, she also audited literature classes. Shortly after she returned to Alaska, she wrote her Akutagawa prize-winning story, Three Crabs. Three Crabs is about the experience of a Japanese housewife living in the U.S. with her husband and daughter. Olpa spent the rest of her life as a prominent author and social critic on both sides of the Pacific. She returned to the U.S. in 1979 as the writer-in-residence at the University of Oregon, The next year, she participated in the International Writers' Seminar at the University of Iowa. In 1987, she became one of the first two women to serve on the Akutagawa Committee in its almost 75-year history. By all appearances, Olba had a reasonably happy marriage. She certainly had a highly successful career, while also a wife and mother. She also remarked, The man I live with, he constantly calls me Yamamba, Yamamba. It seemed like it was a good-natured joke between them. After she suffered a stroke in 1996, it was her husband who took dictation for her so she could continue to write. She wrote almost until her death in 2007. Olba's writing is deeply concerned with the position of women in society, especially the relationships between men and women. Her success never blinded her to the limitations faced by so many other women. It's obvious from her fiction and nonfiction writing that she was deeply aware of feminist concerns. Her heroines often reject traditional marriages. They don't live in the way that the dominant culture tells them to. And that's true for stories that take place in Japan as well as in the U.S. Olba thought that fiction writing couldn't be overtly political writing. In a 1994 interview, she explained... Let's say I start thinking about what I should say or not say as a feminist strategy. Then I don't think my work would be literature. I'd rather not do it that way. Instead, this is how she described her work. A spirit possesses me, and my voice mingles with those of many generations of women. The sum total of the accumulated voices, that's what I want to put down on paper. Writing about the resentment and dreams of many generations of women all intertwined in one, putting down what the spirit dictates you to say, I believe that is the power of literature. Oba also cared deeply about classical Japanese literature. Really, it's part and parcel of the sum of accumulated voices that she wants to put down on paper. She translated Ueda Akinari's unparalleled ghost stories, Tales of Moonlight and Rain, into contemporary Japanese. Read Japanese Literature did an episode about Akinari's work, and you can find a link on the episode page. Oba frequently alludes to or references mythical or literary figures in her work. The Yama Uba seems to be one of her favorites. Yukiko Tanaka is one of Oba's translators. She has remarked that Oba uses the Yama Uba as, quote, the embodiment of all women who defy the constricting rules of society. Minako Oba approached the Yama Uba legend in many of her stories. The Smile of the Mountain Witch is probably the best known and almost certainly the most accessible in English. Oba published it in Japanese in 1976. The Smile of the Mountain Witch opens with something that sounds like an old folk tale. I would like to tell you about a legendary witch who lives in the mountain. 
A man takes shelter with a creepy old woman. She reads his mind over and over again. He becomes very deeply afraid. He decides to run away. And then that tale ends abruptly. At least this is the form the classic mountain witch tales assume. But surely, the narrator continues, these old witches cannot have been wrinkled old hags from birth. And that's the setup for the story. The Smile of the Mountain Witch is about a genuine mountain witch. In the very next sentence, the narrator tells us that this genuine mountain witch dies at 62 years old. That's young, by the way. The average lifespan for a Japanese woman in 1976 was more than 77 years old. In case you're curious, today it's 84. That's almost five full years longer than the average American woman. Just a warning, what follows will definitely include some plot spoilers. But Oba has already given away all the surprises. The protagonist is a Yamauba, and she's going to die. The interest of the story is in the writing. I'm going to analyze the story, but this story is highly worth reading. So what makes the story's protagonist a genuine mountain witch? Even as a very little girl, she can read minds. She knows what her mother is going to scold her for before her mother even opens her mouth. By the time our genuine mountain witch starts school, though, she realizes speaking out isn't normal. She tells her mother, when I say whatever is on my mind, people give me unpleasant looks. So I decided not to anymore. And so our mountain witch has an uncomfortable and complicated relationship with her mother. On the one hand, her mother finds her extremely overwhelming. What mother wouldn't find a mind-reading child overwhelming? On the other hand, though, the mother is deeply upset about her daughter keeping her thoughts to herself. She tells her daughter, speak your mind, but her daughter ignores her. She has decided she wants to make other people happy. And so our mountain witch grows up. She pretends to like what her mother wants her to like. She laughs when other people want her to laugh, and she says what other people want to hear. All of this is easy for her. She can read minds after all. Some of Oba's most biting use of the Yamauba metaphor comes up when she describes the mountain witch's relationship with her husband. The man wants his wife to be, just like the Yamauba, an impossible bundle of contradictions, quote, a substitute for his mother, quote, as dignified as a mother. She has to, quote, love him limitlessly and blindly like an idiot yet at the same time have a spirit capable of being possessed by evil. What does this man have to offer in return? Well, he, and I again quote the narrator, at least has the male characteristic of liking women. He also isn't a Yamauba. It seems like the narrator makes that the key to the husband's happiness. If only one could not see another's heart, the narrator says, one would not become weary and would be able to live happily. Our genuine mountain witch's marriage isn't anything especially cruel. The mountain witch is just ground down by the everyday. She lives with a man who cares more about himself than he does about anyone else, a man who never bothers to see her, or maybe more importantly, a man who never bothers to hear her. She experiences things that are familiar to many women, her doctor writes off her medical concerns, and no one really listens. Over the years, she fantasizes about becoming a real mountain witch. In the mountains, no one will trouble her. In the mountains, she can think as she pleases. She has one fantasy that makes glorious use of the Yamauba imagery. She's in the forest. Her husband appears dressed like a beggar. I'm just going to read it out. Listening to his voice, she would look at her face reflected in a clear spring. Then she would see that half her face was smiling like an affectionate mother, while the other half was seething with demonic rage. Blood would trickle down half her mouth while it devoured and ripped the man's flesh apart. The other half of her lips were caressing the man who curled up his body in the shadow of one of her breasts, sucking it like a baby." The story's most heartbreaking moment is probably when the protagonist lies on her deathbed. 
First, the genuine mountain witch's daughter speaks to the witch in her mind. We don't get told how or for how long the daughter has known, but it is clear that the daughter knows her mother's secret. And then, in her last moments, the genuine mountain witch realizes that her own mother must have been a mountain witch as well. The ending is heartbreaking because the women in this family are trapped in a cycle they have been passing down from generation to generation. They aren't empowering their daughters to stand up for who they are. They're just passing down histories of unhappiness, self-denial, and shame. So why read about the Yamauba? Frankly, the Yamauba is fascinating in all of her incarnations. As a folktale character, as a no heroine, as a modern protagonist. It's characters like the Yamauba that reward digging into another culture's literature. The payoff is in every single Japanese story where a sly old woman turns out to be more than she seems. And I'm going to come back to that line by translator Alison Markin Powell that I really love because it's so important. By reading women in translation, readers demonstrate that there is a demand for the subjects that women choose to write about and the perspective that they offer, that it makes a difference who tells the story and why they tell it. Minako Oba is part of a generation of Japanese women writers who are underrepresented in English translation. More people are reading work by contemporary Japanese women writers like Sayaka Murata and Mieko Kawakami. Hopefully, English language publishers will see that there's a growing interest in writers like Minako Oba, too. That's something that strong women soft power translators like Powell are working on, and it's something that we as readers can encourage by reading and talking about these books. Today, I've been reading from Noriko Mizuta Lippitt's translation of The Smile of the Mountain Witch. She was assisted on that translation by Mariko Ochi. You can find that translation in several anthologies. There are links to all of them on the episode page. Personally, I recommend Yamamba, In Search of the Japanese Mountain Witch, edited by Rebecca Copeland and Linda C. Ehrlich. As I've already mentioned, it's a rich, diverse, multi-genre, and truly unique anthology about the Yamauba. You can find links to purchase that book, as well as links to a bibliography and resources at readjapaneseliterature.com. Buy your books through our link to bookshop.org to support the podcast. Several listeners a month are supporting us that way. We really appreciate you. You're helping us offset the cost of preparing these episodes. You can also support the podcast in other ways. Leave a review on your podcast app of choice. You can become a supporter through Patreon for as little as $3 a month. For $10 a month, you get a lovely RJL laptop sticker. And for $25 a month, we'll send you a personalized Japanese book recommendation every month. Find out more at patreon.com slash read Japanese literature. Next time, I Am a Cat by Natsume Soseki, A Cat, A Man, and Two Women by Junichiro Tanizaki, The Traveling Cat Chronicles by Hiro Arikawa, She and Her Cat by Naruki Nagakawa and Makoto Shinkai, slated for its U.S. release at the end of November. Why are there so many Japanese books about cats? We'll be looking at cats in Japanese culture, especially using Zach Davison's phenomenal book, Kaibyo, The Supernatural Cats of Japan. We'll talk about cats in the work of Haruki Murakami, and I'd like to get listeners' feedback about what book deserves a closer look. The Cat Who Saved Books by Sosuke Natsukawa is a witty fantasy satire on the capitalist market of ideas. The Guest Cat by poet Takahashi Hiraide is a quiet novel about relationships and the passage of time. Or The Town of Cats by Hagiwara Sakutaro is a short story by one of Japan's great modernist poets. Follow at Read Japanese Lit on Twitter for a chance to chime in. We love to hear from you about the podcast. You can always tweet us at, at Read Japanese Lit or use the contact page on the website. Thank you to the Japanese Literature Twitter community. The scholars on Twitter have been really generous with me, especially with resources about post-war Japanese feminism. I learned a lot, and I look forward to bringing that to you in upcoming episodes. 
Thank you in particular to Dr. Kristen Luck and the George Washington University Library's Japan Resource Center. Thank you to the Japanese Literature Group on Goodreads and the Japanese Literature Group on Facebook. Thank you, as always, to producer Kaim for today's music at Kaim Music and KaimMusic.com.